everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Universe Within podcast. This episode of the show is being sponsored by the Amazonian Plant Healing Center, the Temple of the Way of Light. The temple is a place I've worked at for about the past uh, 10 years, decade now, and I can really attest to the quality of the work they do. Predominantly, they're working with the plant medicine ayahuasca, working in a lineage of a group of people called the Shipibo people. Uh, they have a center outside Iquitos in, in Peru, which is uh, the, the biggest Amazonian town in the, the Peruvian Amazon. And they run 12-day retreats. Uh, there's six ceremonies in that time, so it's an opportunity to go really deep, to work with uh, a number of ceremonies, working with four Shipibo doctors, healers, curanderos, two to three facilitators. Uh, they have pre-ceremony yoga teachers, bone doctors, herbalists, uh, an amazing uh, support staff and integration team. So it's really an amazing opportunity to go really deeply into this work. Um, they've unfortunately been closed since March of 2020, but they're scheduled to open uh, next month in August of this year. So if you'd like more information about them, you can check out their website at templeofthewayoflight.org. And then also myself and my colleague, Marav Artsy, uh, we just finished a dieta, a retreat here in upstate New York. And uh, we're going back to the Sacred Valley of Peru and continuing to run diets in, um, in the Sacred Valley near Urubamba. And that's a really amazing opportunity to go really deeply into the world of plant medicine, into the tradition we've predominantly been trained with, uh, working with tobacco and different trees and going into a period of isolation, fasting, and really experiencing the, the healing benefits, the, the, the psychological benefits and the spiritual benefits of a really ancient process of working with these plants and trees. So if you'd like more information about that, uh, our next dieta will be in September. You can visit my website at nicotianarustica.org and Marav's site at tobaccodiets.com. My guest for today is my very old friend, John Keegan. Uh, John and I met a, a number of years ago in New York uh, where we were sharing similar interests and he uh, developed, a, I think, a really interesting and, and beautiful career path, which is a relationship coach uh, and really basing it upon a, a lot of principles of um, of being in the present moment, of breaking down barriers, of overcoming internal fears. So while this podcast isn't maybe directly related to a lot of plant medicine work, I think a lot of the principles he's speaking about uh, really go hand in hand because it's actually getting to, to the root of the same things uh, that, that hold a lot of people back and, and kind of keep people from being in that state of, of flow, of, of, of harmony, of peace, of, of joy. Uh, so it was a really good conversation. Uh, I, I enjoyed catching up with him and speaking with him, and I, I think and hope you all will really enjoy this episode. Uh, as always, if you're able to support the podcast, that's a really big help. Patreon is a really good option. It's a, a subscription service for as little as a dollar a month. You can subscribe. There's a few different tiers. There's, I think, a dollar, three dollars, seven dollars. Um, and that gives you some really nice added benefits, things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q and A's. So that's a really big help to me to be able to continue to bring on these guests. Um, also with uh, YouTube now, there's an option to join. It's basically the same tiers, but uh, you can do that via YouTube. There should be a little join button down uh, below this video. Uh, there's also the option to direct donate via PayPal, and I'll put a link to all of those in the show notes. And if you're not able to do that, simply subscribing to the show is a really big help. So going in the YouTube channel, subscribing to the show, turning on the notification bell, liking the video, that's a really big help. And then with the audio version going on Apple Podcasts, uh, I think now it's called following the show and leaving a starred rating and a review is also a really big help. Uh, so thank you all for the support. I hope you enjoy this episode. And without further ado, here is my conversation with John. Running out from the maze, running out of the maze today. Running out from the maze, running out from the maze, running out from the maze today. I'm running out from the maze, running out from the maze, running out of the maze today. All right, let's just go. Just improv, right? Yeah, just All improv. Right. <laughs> All right, let's think about it. All right. Okay, I have a wife, three kids, <laughs> and 
that go into a divorce. <laughs> Got it. That's it. Okay. So, so that's kind of a good intro because uh, we met, I don't know. How long ago was it? Yeah, I, oh, I tried. 2003, four, maybe? Yeah, well, when did you first did that? I moved here in 2002. Yeah, and then how soon after did you start taking that acting class? Yeah, so that's yeah. when we met, because that's yeah. when I was there. That's amazing. I can't even almost, believe that. Almost 20 years Yeah, ago. that's crazy, right? Yeah. yeah. And when people ask me how long I've lived in New York, I always stop at 10. I like 10. <laughs> I don't know, just leave it there. Yeah. yeah. So I met you. I met you in uh, Tom Waits' acting class. Yeah, that's right. Uh, which was an amazing. It was an amazing place. It was an amazing place. It was an amazing time because uh, it really felt like something was happening. It was so much creative energy and so many unique personalities that were really like found their home and and they and they were coming there to. Uh, bring their bring their a game and then it just kept going like leveling up every week after week after week so uh, and then we had a, that a professional photographer who was so inspired he just had to come by and start capturing everything memo Zach yeah. yeah yeah he had to yeah. keep coming by capture everything we had this the mad uh, genius director mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it was a special time yeah, it really was. So what uh, what initially drew you to, to acting? Oh, yeah, I mean... Because you studied with the, in the Stanford Meisner tradition yeah, in Philadelphia? Or? Yeah, Stanford Meisner tradition. Stanford Meisner, and there was a guy named Sidney Kay. And Sidney was an old, old school, and he had, uh, was Stanford Meisner's main guy for like a few decades, you know, co coaching with him. And, uh, and at one point, he decided to move to Philadelphia, where I was from, in the suburbs. And so literally, like, this guy moved into my neighboring town. And at the time, I, I always wanted to be an actor, but I didn't really know how to go about it, just in, like, a suburban town. And a girlfriend, my first girlfriend, kept, I kept saying I want to be an actor, and she was uh, actually looked up how I could be an actor. Huh. And she found that guy. And then I, so I was like, oh, I was kind of nervous to go to class. And then I went to the class. And then right away, it was like, wow, this guy's amazing. And it was literally uh, like studying for me, like um, like studying with a, you know, you're, I'm, I'm young. I'm, I'm like became a disciple. And be, so it was like studying like a, with a Buddha or a Zen or a Zen master, a guy. And in a way, this kind of acting is this sort of everything's about living truthfully in the moment. Uh, you know, being authentic in a moment-to-moment -moment way by listening, relating, and responding with the other people, with the other person, with your own breath, with the moment. And so in this way, it was following this, this became how can I be uh, my real self. And the whole technique of the Sanford Meisner technique is to free your true persona mm -hmm. under an imaginary circumstance. So... Uh, you know, you're two, uh, you and I were two bank robbers in the 1930s. Uh, you, you were always messing the job up. And me, <laughs> and me, uh, you know, and, I, and I'm trying to, you know, figure out uh, how, how to get us through this, this day so we won't get arrested and we get our next meal. And, and we have all that going. And that could be the imaginary circumstances. But then and there, we have to free uh, our own truth in a real moment to moment way and not play cliches. Mm -hmm. And what I found fascinating about it was, uh, that Sidney Kay and Sanford Meisner before him and uh, those kind of teachers, they sit there for their entire lives helping people break out of the fake persona they created for themselves, the mask. The, and, and when they sit in front of people, they're always wearing a mask, uh, you know, protecting themselves, um, projecting themselves in a way they'd like to be seen or they think they'd like to be seen. And really like that kind of work they they do an exercise one of the main exercises called the word game and it's all about listening relating and responding to the other person not your own ego not your own ego identity mm -hmm. so um that could take months and months and if you did like a hardcore schooling of that like two-year program that they have um it would be the first six months would just be this game and then tearing away all your false selves so that you could just literally easily connect with another person as yourself, but as yourself, not an idea of yourself, as yourself in the moment as you present yourself. 
by listening, relating, and responding to your own breath, to the moment, to the other person. I mean, that, that was kind of a revolutionary idea, right? Because a lot of acting, even when you look back at, like, and for any of the audience, I think this will eventually tie into to, to, to maybe a larger picture of mm. things like spirituality, living in the present, even plant medicines. But a lot of Greek theater it used to be this idea of putting on masks, like playing mm. the archetype. Right. <clears throat> like, now I'm the angry person, and you put on an angry mask. Or right. Now I'm the sad person, and I put on a sad mask, and playing these archetypes. And there was, there's, there's something powerful about that, but really this idea of what you were talking about is the opposite of that. It's like peeling away the masks mm. to reveal who you truly are. Right. So what do you think is, what do you think was that shift where, because I think when a lot of people think about acting, you know, I remember we were talking about this the other day, like we used to, we used to go to, to Times Square to, to where Broadway was. And what? We were probably the only two guys who who had seen every single theatrical show, but only the second half. Yeah, <laughs> just the intermission. Yeah, that's true. Like that's an amazing story. Yeah, because we yeah. would sneak in because we didn't have any money to go yeah. see shows. So right. we would just we'd find out. We'd we'd look at the playbill, see how long the show was, do the math, basically find out when intermission was. And then just kind of walk up, smoke a cigarette outside, yeah. and the crowd came out. And then when they went back in, we'd just go in with the crowd, and we just like look around. We wait till everyone sat down, <laughs> <laughs> look around, hoping that there was a couple seats open. Yeah, because some people would inevitably be, be be bored, right. Right? And, or just right. they'd leave. They did what they wanted to do, and then we'd go in. And then there'd be times where we'd be like walking around looking, and people. <laughs> the show was so good, there was no empty seats. We're like, oh, we we'd have to talk. And we lost our place. I, you know. <laughs> but that was amazing and some of those plays we read so we knew the story we yeah. taught the story yeah that was cool but I always I mean I don't know if you have the same memory but I, I remember being very disappointed because almost all of the theater we were watching was terrible yeah and for me it was because people were playing that idea of putting on these masks mm. you know this idea of like acting like you know, going up on stage and putting on this persona, and it was terrible. And playing to the audience. Playing to the yeah, audience. Right. And a lot of the audience seemed to love it. But even what I noticed in the audience is they loved it because they were also in that Cosmo vision of, I need to like this. Mm. Like, this is an experience, and they're showing me right. something, therefore it's good. Mm. But it lacked spirit. It lacked mm. something that... that that moved me in a way that some theater when I had seen and seeing it myself in the beginning and then participating in it, it was actually a very religious experience. Mm. There was something about this stillness, about the peeling away of these layers where there was like such a presence and such an engagement that it, it in a way transcended space and time. And there was, a, there was, and I don't use that word lightly, but there was a religious experience that happened. Yeah, no, that, that's, and I think, well, when you see acting that is amazing, it's really rare. When you really connect with those certain actors, like I think I remember we saw one play, The Pillow Man, we got to see halfway through and it had like uh, Jeff Goldblum and this guy Billy Crudup and some other, uh -huh. and there were some moments in that one that were really good, that were really on top of it, you know, it's like, but like an example of when there there was a change was uh, well, when the natural acting shifted was that Stanislavski and uh, Anton Chekhov was the playwright, Stanislavski was the acting teacher, and they shifted the whole world to natural acting, and then there was a progression that happened over decades. And then one guy one day showed up in a movie named Marlon Brando, and it was like someone parted the sea. The whole rest of the movie, everyone was talking about the 1930s actors real fast. And, yeah, you see, yeah, that's good, chump. Yeah, I love you. All right, man. You know, that, that whole thing. And then this guy came, and all of a sudden, uh, black and white became uh, color. And then that inspired generations of people, and to this day. Mm -hmm. So most acting we see, some better than others, is, is rooted in this my true persona kind of acting. 
finding that unique thing, right? Like Bruce Willis then tapped into his unique persona and he shares it, you know. And then, you know, he might become a, cl a cliche of himself at one point. Mm -hmm. But at one point, he really tapped into it. Or a lot, a lot of actors and then become movie stars just based off of that. Whereas Johnny Depp moves more into, he has that and then he adds all these characters on top of it, right? And again, uh, sometimes he's amazing and sometimes he becomes a cliche of himself, right? Because he's got to be, you know, he's got other pressures besides just being an actor. Uh, you know, movie producers and things. But yeah, I think that um, that persona, that, that, that to find that pure art thing, and that's what we were looking for. That's who we were then, right? Which is probably why we're not famous as actors, <laughs> right? Because that's really what we care about. Like, we had like stupid codes, like, uh, like I wouldn't do a commercial, we wouldn't do any of that. We, we were just really looking for the truth. And that's what we were looking for. We were looking for the truth the best way we could find it. And it was through this, this avenue, how we could find our authentic self and really connect to that and really share that. And we really believed that that was the most powerful thing in the world. And that's where we were at. And that's why we were doing that. And we were going to figure out our way. And I do think we, we, when we got to experience that when you're doing those scenes, when you're finding those moments, even though you have nothing, you have your day job, you have, your, you have to make the rent, you know, we, were, we were constantly busy, right? You're constantly working, uh, working on a scene, uh, trying to do stuff, you know, trying to have a life. It was a lot. Uh, but I remember thinking at one point, having gotten a few roles in, you know, some little bit of movie here and there and things like that, that this isn't what I thought it would be. I thought it would be something more than this. Or or you seems like you can only get to this one point, be the one, you know, the one percent at the top of this thing that gets to do the really interesting stuff. So I kind of felt like, you know, even if I could have been the guy who got all the commercials and all that, that wasn't what I was there for. That wasn't what I was I would just be a guy with making money with a career and that would be cool. But I was there for this other experience, and um, I wasn't really finding it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, do you remember that kind of transition to to where you became interested or, or, or started going down that path of what you're doing now, and well, what what drew you to that? Well, what well, really, what drew me to that was um, I personally felt a lot of you know it was again like this this search for taking this uh, this persona this truth thing and taking it to the streets. What I found was one of the things that makes an actor really love acting is the high that you get when you're connecting with another person in a heightened awareness. There's a heightened awareness when there's people watching and there's a, and all of a sudden you tune in like you never tune in in your life because in your life you're always thinking I got it's uh, if you ask yourself how how um much am I really with people when I'm with them? Usually it's like I'm there, but I really kind of want to be somewhere else or I should be somewhere else or something about this moment's making me uncomfortable or whatever. But when you, in acting, you really tune into the moment. You can feel the, the blood running through your veins. You can feel your, own, your breath going in and out. It's like you become this hyper aware and then you can tune into this other person. And there was this freedom uh, that I would feel that you generally would feel that you're free from the mind, you're free from the past, you're free from the future. And I remember very specifically at the time, you know, uh, that I was always like, I never had enough money. I was always bouncing checks and, uh, you know, getting that stupid overdraft thing. And uh, I was, you know, living in, uh, which was fine for me, but I was living, if you remember, I was living in a uh, hoarder's lair, I like to call it, where it was a guy who I rented a room from on the Upper West Side, beautiful neighborhood, and he had this old 2,000 square foot rent stabilized apartment, and I rented a room in the back. And it was just even paying him, I could hardly come up with that rent to have that luxury. <laughs> so it was like those kind of things, and then just general probably habits of neg negative thinking that I had from my whole life and then my poor diet at the time and uh you know we would go out drinking at the time so all these things create negative frequencies within me but in those moments i discovered this now thing you know this wow that's that powerful now and i was so obsessed with this idea how can i get more into the now and then i found eckhart tolle the power of now 
and I read the book and I used to have this uh, sales job and remember I had the company car that we would park illegally and I thought we were getting away with it until they came to me and said you got all these tickets <laughs> that was part of our Broadway show we would literally just pull up in front of a Broadway show park in front of a fire hydrant and they'd be like iron it's a big company they're never gonna know and <laughs> yeah so and we'd go in but um don't don't park in yeah. front of fire. Hydrants. Yeah, don't park in front of fire. <laughs> I'm exaggerating a little bit. But we were definitely parked in a spot. Where we'd be like, I don't think you should park here, but you know, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I just got really into listening. I would drive around, listen to that all day, every day, in in New York, in the traffic, and thinking about. And he would be like, you know, by you know, changing your energy by constantly practicing and then in then being in the present by stilling your mind your circumstances will change now it was hard for me to believe that because my, I, I, what i had seen my parents be and what i had been is you know maybe a little less than them but it was sort of like life happens to you it's just happening it's just happening to me everything's just happening to me right so uh i i started to realize that what he was saying is is that everything that's happening to you is you created it and I was like, it's hard. I was wrestling with this idea. Sometimes I'd be like, wow, it's so amazing. I'm so inspired. Sometimes I'd be like, oh, fuck this guy. Who is this guy? <laughs> right? So, you know, because you, when, you, when you're not enjoying the circumstance or the situation, you know, you want to blame something other than yourself, especially when you don't see how it happened. So, but over time, I just kept listening to that and trying to discover what he was talking about and going back to this simple thing where there is no problem in the now and I knew that that was true because every time I got into the now I felt euphoria exhilaration and over time obviously my circumstance changed amazingly actually unbelievably I've been all over the world coaching people I've uh, done well for myself I'm having a great life I'm, a, I'm uh, happy most of the time uh, you know all that so but what I then I got into was is this idea of being social uh, for flirting with women for we, we would get ourselves into a lot of situations where we would be able to network in this in this acting and theater and and I would find myself around uh, people that I deemed to be a uh, high status higher status than me have more achieved than me and um, and what if I was around women that I thought were highly attractive and then all of a sudden I felt like I wasn't enough. Something, there was that feeling like I'm not enough, you know, and then I have to figure something out. And then what I realized, you know, back in college I majored in um, psychology and I particularly like B.F. Skinner, which was like change, a behavior modification, change how to fade in and change uh, behavior. And I was like, well, what I need to do is go out onto the streets of New York and I need to uh, start approaching strangers. And I need to approach attractive women and, and just everybody and start this idea of improv improving with regular people. This idea, this feeling I'm getting in this acting thing on the streets. And so if I saw a woman that I thought was attractive, uh, I would walk up and say something like, Oh, do you know where, you know, uh, you know, which way that is? And then she would be like, yeah, oh, yeah, it's this way. And I'd say, oh, thanks. And we'd have like a moment back and forth and I'd walk away. And then I would do things like, you know, the, you know, I mean, these, these aren't great tricks, but I would do things like, hey, that's a beautiful dog, you know, like, and, and do that. Or I'd, if, you know, if I see an old man, he's walking with an umbrella, I'd say, you know, hey, uh, something about the umbrella or something about the clouds coming in. Or if it was a sunny day, I would just walk by people. And as, and I made this assignment, the first five people I see, I'm going to say something to I'm gonna make a comment, I, 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 I wave it hello, and I'm going to immediately go outside of my head. Because in my head, it was not fun. It was always like going backwards, spinning, looping on negative, negative, negative. And so in there, it was terrible. So it, we're projecting about something in the future. So I would just go out and I was finding this. I can be present. Just simple gift. I discovered an improv. I can do it on the street by going out and connecting with all the people around me. And then, of course, I knew that uh, or I believed that, it, I believed that there was blocks I had that I needed to go through. Like, I thought about, you know, me uh, feeling inadequate with dating the women I really wanted to date. And I thought, you know, people build empires, 
so that then it's like I'll hear here now look now you will come to my nest you know and I thought well I'm gonna go directly into the fire and that's the only way through this for me is to go directly into the fire because that's the kind of same thing we were doing all the time going into the fire and the emotional fire so I would go in over and over and I started to discover like wow I all of a sudden tapped into all that charisma that I discovered in acting and I brought it out into the streets and I took that simple process of listening uh, observing people uh, saying what I saw to them in the moment that I saw it and then listening to them and relating with them and empathizing with them and then flirting with them in certain situations and then moving past all these points where I felt like um, internal like resistance to say ask a girl out on a date or um, or give her a, a compliment that I genuinely thought where I was just learning to really give freely or give without uh, you know give without worrying about receiving and I started to tap into that and I was going about it from this idea that I'm practicing the power of now this isn't about John getting a, a girlfriend or John having sex this is about John every time he walks past that resistance point that fear point that angst point every time I step on the other side of that I become more me I become more me and that's good for me, that's good for everybody I meet, it's good for the world because it's one more person not living uh, a lot. So that that's what it was and then and then I, at that time, you know, you and I had also just gotten really into health food. We were into the raw, raw vegan. We had met Dr. David Jubb, and he was teaching us a lot about the plants, right? He was teaching us about the healing properties. And you had discovered him just walking down the street one day, right? And then you were like, we, we got, because we were already trying to figure, well, that was a whole journey, right? Where we thought uh, the Indian cab driver's food was the healthiest food. We would stop at the cab driver's place. And you're like, look, this is the Indian food's healthy. And I would eat it. And my stomach would be like, no, this is something's not right. And then we kind of figure our way to uh, pure food. You know? Yeah. Because um, there's a lot of oils in that food. Uh, anyway. Yeah, so I had already stepped, gotten healthy. I'd gotten into this spiritual mindset, and then and then I took it out to the streets. Then it just became a matter of I had a friend who was always, uh, you know, an entrepreneur, and he was always thinking, uh, you know, cause I would meet a lot of cool people in the Upper West Side. There's a lot of people who, you know, it's different than say like living in the East Village, where it's all young people. It's like people who did already made things happen. I just happened to be living in a hoarder's lair, but. I, I presented well and you know <laughs> so I uh, so and he kept saying um, you should make a business out of that you should do that and I'm like no I'm gonna do Shakespeare I'm gonna do this stuff and that's what I'm doing and he said no there's something here you should uh, help people meet people you should help people connect with people you should help people get past uh, their shyness and I kept thinking uh, yeah, that's, you know, I'm on this other, you know, there was an, um, a, what's a delusional, there was a delusional thing, like, this is going to happen, you know, uh, and anyway, long story short, there was a point where I was like, I don't, you know, I was my, I was having a lot of cognitive dissonance, I'm working for a company in sales, uh, I don't really identify with this, this isn't who I thought I would be, I'm not really bringing my best self to that. Uh, and then this doesn't seem to be really working out, this acting stuff. Uh, um, I need to come up with something else. It was just like, I don't, this isn't a life I want to live. It was really like, to be exaggerated, I could say, I'd rather die. You know, I felt like that. I'd rather die than be do this anymore. So, but it was just, I don't want to live this way. So I simply did what I could and I put, this is 2007, I put an ad on Craigslist. And that was back, Craigslist was actually a thing. And I put an ad on like, hey, uh, awaken to a new reality, learn to meet and connect with people anywhere and everywhere. Uh, and I didn't know who would respond or whatever, so I just said like, awaken, I just put awaken. You know? <laughs> and that was it, no name, uh, no nothing, no website. Uh, it was just you respond to this, <laughs> this ad and then I'll write right back to you. And what was interesting was is people responded. And it was, I mean, I was gearing it more towards men at the time. And men responded. And uh, they were cool guys. They were interesting. They weren't like, you know, the, the people that people would be worried about or something like that. And, uh, and then what I had done, I met this guy and we went into Central Park and 
we walked from one side of the park to the other and I was just waving at people saying hi it was like I was in the zone and he was watching me and uh, he said oh man that's amazing oh wow and he gave me a hundred dollars that's what I said just give me a hundred bucks for that that's all I knew right? but even though I had been paid in lots of ways before I never felt better than that uh, I just made something up out of thin air that I'm having fun being me and some guy gave me a hundred bucks and my brain lit up like this is possible and uh, I kept getting more people, and then I started realizing, you know, you know, how can I add in, uh, make a program? You know, I had to make a program. Like, how can I actually help these people? I really wanted to help people go where they wanted to go. And so I started, you know, okay, uh, let's, let's do, we're going to start with meditating. We're going to start with stilling our mind. And I would just do these, uh, you know, Eckhart Tolle style meditations where you go into your body. And then I would give like a guided visualization of them seeing themselves in another way. And I would just start playing around with it. And then I came up with programs. And then over time, I came up with some really good programs. And then over, and I kept raising my prices more and more to actually make a living out of it. And, um, by 2009, I had gotten in the New York Times as, you know, big story of this guy, this Hitch character, you know, this Hitch character in New York. And then that became a whole, like, mainstream media thing. Then it was, I'm in Marie Claire, Men's Health, Entrepreneur Magazine. Uh, and it goes on to this day, you know, I'm the number one uh, dating expert on WikiHow. And it just kept... Um, going so i had that kind of stream going where like oh this you know i would get on uh, fox and friends in the morning or other live tv shows and that was exciting so all that acting stuff was really coming into play the improv and then um of course i also had like a street credibility people kept hearing about me and referring me and i would get i'd do a lot of public speaking so all the stuff that we had worked on started to come to fruition in, in its own way and i got to be my own man in a very strange way, in a way I could have never planned or thought of. I never would have thought of her. And then uh, I would meet all kinds of people all around the world. And, you know, even though I had started as, okay, I'm the expert ab above somebody, I still had a lot to learn. And all along the way, I was meeting all these people that were different than me, that were way more... Uh, advanced to me in many other areas of life so I started learning what they would have so here I was a poor actor and suddenly I'm helping a CEO of a hedge fund or a doctor or uh, a director or um, he or just or just you know or just a college student or but it was like I'm all walks of life every background possible every religion possible every everyone you know so it's and then, so it was really amazing so i learning from them and learning their skills and then uh, and i would meet a lot of tech people you know people in their head who lived in their head all day and i would help them free themselves and uh, and then i would learn a lot of things i would have never learned which also changed my life you know and then um yeah, so it was, that was the journey, and then of course I worked with a lot of women as well, and I started figuring out programs that how I can help women, and and then always finding a way to make it fun for myself. I kept always because you know you, things get stale. You get you know, doing a routine, and and because in, I really the best thing I'm good at is improvisation, not just on a stage, but in life. You know, just so I just kept finding, always finding a way. Like, hey, this is feeling. I feel like dreading doing this today. Make it fun for yourself. Constantly making it fun for myself so that it's fun for everyone else. So that's that's kind of been that journey. And, uh, yeah, I did get to do it all over the world. And uh, South America, Europe, other places, wherever other places in the world are. Yeah. yeah. It was reminding me, again, about like this idea of taking masks off and freeing oneself. Why do you think that's so important? And because what what came to mind there's a there's a like a Zen story. I know everything can be related as a Zen story, but mm -hmm. there's this one where there's a teacher. He has all of these students, and and one day the king invites him to give a speech. And he gives the speech, and he comes back to his students, and he says, "I, I can't be your teacher anymore." And the students look at him like, "Why? Well, you know, you're this great teacher. The king is having you speak." And he says, because I got sweaty palms. And the point of that story was, for him, his whole teaching was about equilibrium, about finding the middle, finding the center. 
And yet when he was invited by the king, he got nervous. Mm. He wouldn't have gotten nervous in front of his students or in front of an average person. But because he was the king, in his mind, he still had these masks on, these ideas of this is a more elevated person, or this is a famous person, or this is a person of power. And for him, that was a separation, it was a division, and it was antithetical to his teaching, which was about union, about wholeness. And uh, I mean, it's something I, I see with a lot of people. I mean, even just now, especially in kind of without getting too much into politics, but the political climate where it's all about identity. I am the color of my skin. I am my gender. I am this. I am this. And seeing how people react in that that way. And you are this color skin color. You are that gender. You are part of that tribe. You are, it's very, you know, here in New York, you really feel it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how we look at people. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we don't look at the, the essence of the person. We see, well, that person is that. Therefore I need to be this way, which is exactly the moral of that story with the monk i mean i see it even in my work you know people people treat maybe indigenous people a certain way for the worse and also for the better Mm. (laughs) you know but for the better in the sense that they look at them as somehow maybe more elevated or or less elevated Uh, but it's it's getting away from the essence. And I think that's something so many people experience is there's very few people, maybe the Buddha and Jesus, mm. who really, they are themselves because they've, they've completely taken away all of those layers. And mm. so it doesn't matter. I'm speaking to a peasant. I'm speaking to a king. It's no different. Mm. I see the essence of that person. There's nothing in me that's left to respond to them in any different way. Mm. So why do you think that's important? Because that was something you were really speaking about, is like on the street, interacting with people, meeting people, like overcoming that fear, overcoming that anxiety, overcoming seeing that person as higher status. As, mm. Because we all do that. Like that, those stories are running in all of our minds. And for me, that that's one of these things, you know, all of these like spiritual paths or even plant medicine, it's actually trying to strip away these layers. Mm. And that's also what you're saying. But why do you think that's so important to strip away those layers and to be able to interact with people in a way that's free, in a way that's flowing? Well, yeah, you know, it's interesting because it's stripping away the layers. And also when you're, you know, like I would say, like, I'm not up on a mountain, uh, hiding, or not, I want to say hiding. I'm not up in a mountain uh, being a monk. And that's not hiding. I'm just saying, I'm not up there. I'm down here. I came down from the mountain to be in the mix. And I can tell you, like, I walk out this door and there's all kinds of people doing all kinds of things. And um, you can have in one, two, or three blocks, you can see the most beautiful images, the most beautiful people. You can see the most. Um, psychotic people getting inches from your face you can smell the worst smells Uh, someone could unjustly bang into you all kinds of things can happen that your ego has to deal with in that three black period and you can react to all of them you know in a positive negative this way and definitely do it and have done it um so it's like we're in this in a city, in a place, or in a town, when you're in life, when you're engaged in life, you're you're engaged with other people, and when you're engaged with other people, that's going to have your naturally have your ego react every day. Not that you don't have an ego, that not that having an identity is can be healthy is it is healthy, but uh, over attaching to it is the problem. Mm-hmm. So, for example, a lot of um, I'll meet a lot of men specifically that have that Mr. Nice Guy syndrome. So it appears that they're totally free of all this stuff we just talked about. They're always nice. They're always helpful. But really, they're disconnected in another way. They're not feeling like, for example, if you see someone you're attracted to, something biologically, chemically happens. Your eyes widen. Your pupils dilate. Adrenaline starts coursing through your veins at the possibility that some that you and that person could become one in some way you and that person could have uh sex could have love could have uh create a world together whatever it is that happens in less than time create life yeah so it's 
when you go up connecting with that person, it's not to that's there, and you want to. And it's the same as an actor getting on a stage in front of five thousand people. You walk out like he just walked out, walked into his bathroom. You know, what I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the truth is, as they say, those kind of guys are thrown up in buckets before they walk out. Their adrenaline's course, coursing through the thing. So it's learning how to use that that feeling and be be. Ca- be be like a pilot in a storm in turbulence, you know, and that's what's fun about it. Uh, and, or like um, comfortable being uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable meeting new people, tuning into them, uh, being vulnerable in front of them. It's uncomfortable. But so the layers that you remove in this way that I'm that I'm helping remove are also. At the same time that you have a, na- a natural born desire, like a instinctual desire, mm-hmm. whereas not an egoic desire. An egoic desire would be like, I have to get the uh, phone numbers today. I have to get uh, uh, laid 17 times this week. I have to, <laughs> whatever, you know, the, or I have to, I have, to have uh, the most uh, beautiful husband the, the world has ever seen and he has to have this this and that and i can present him to people this is ego kind of love people treating each other like objects you know and the classic paradigm is a man success object woman beauty object but it can be all over the place somehow you're just this object object you know and not seeing the people so what, we're, what i'm doing is just really helping them tap in you know to their own true interests and passions what they really want and even though it's just like removing those layers yes but they keep coming back and it's really having a process to overcome resistance having a process a way to in the moment that all these things arise where your ego comes up to transcend it so i personally haven't found like a way to be egoless but i found a way a process to transcend my ego in the moment that it arises. That doesn't mean I always do it. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, but I do it a lot more than I used to. And, um, and it helps people connect. It helps me connect with people on a deeper level. I'm transcending my ego in the moment it arises. And like you said, it's a political climate. It's a little less than it was, you know, last year. But it's a political climate and it's very easy and when you when everyone's looking at you and they're putting you in a box and then you start to go into that box and then you, you get reactive from that box. Uh, so we've definitely never been challenged like in my lifetime at least but like this before as as you know because it really was, you know, maybe all those things were there but we were supposed to tr- not look at each other like that. Yeah. So um there's all these ways that we can get reactive in, from inside that box, and that's why I think in this time now, meditation of some kind, uh, some some way, some process of stilling your mind daily, uh, frequently tapping into your higher self, having a meeting with beyond you know beyond yourself, because all kinds of things happen in life, uh, and then they bother you, and you loop on them, and 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 you have to kind of keep finding ways to go beyond your mind. And, that, and that's what I found and teach to people. Here's how, a way you can go beyond your mind. Uh, that doesn't mean you don't have to work on what's going, the beliefs you have, because we have to work on changing our beliefs, which happens over time. Like if you start begin to believe that I am more than enough, I am an overflowing cup of joy and abundance. Uh, being social is healthy. Um, uh, men are, uh, you know, if you see, a lot of times people have, uh, negative opinions like a man could be like oh women just these some, some guys with negative voices like oh they just want guys with money or men just want you want use women for sex or you know some people are you know same same sex relationships so but they have these I, this this opinion of the people they desire that's negative and it keeps them from connecting with it with that person with the other people and it's like reframing those beliefs about yourself whatever they are reframing the beliefs about uh being a social human being about flirting you know people have really 
some people have really like, oh, you know, they feel like they're being bad. We're doing something bad by giving a compliment or, or, or telling someone they're, uh, you know, they have a way about them and I had to say hi and what, or um, various things, physical touch, all kinds of things. So it's like le learning to be able to give and receive uh, freely with other people. And that other people that want to participate doing that with you, not everyone does, you know. So, so it's just l learning those processes uh, through this is just dealing with yourself. And, and but the changing the beliefs is something that you practice every day, but it happens more over time. That suddenly, like my new resting place was nowhere near the resting place to when we met, and neither is yours. But it's like I'm like. I don't have depression and anxiety and, um, you know, generally my, my mood is high. Generally I feel great about things, you know? So it's like, well, I found a, a, a serene resting place that happened over time. But what I found with, when you find a way to get into the now, like acting or things like that, you literally, uh, le transcend your mind and you become right in the now and there's no problem right away automatically you're no longer whatever your history was whatever you've been future projecting you're no longer that you're just here and anybody can do that today and that's what's so cool you can do it today and you can create momentum around that today and that's that was what uh, excited me and still excites me about that so when you're saying that just for clarification it's it's this idea that, that literally because there only is present Mm. And, and I think for a lot of people, that's that may sound obvious. That may also sound very strange. But in reality, in reality is everything. Right now, in this moment, that's all there is. Mm. The past and the future just come as mind mind thoughts. I mm. think about the past or I imagine the future, but it's never real. It's always just a thought, which mm. is always ephemeral. Mm. And by really being present, like by really being aware, there literally can be no problems because every problem is a thought. Like even if someone comes and attacks me, it's only a problem when my mind starts to go to, oh my God, what if this happens? What if this happens? Mm. In the present, there's just a reaction. There's just, there's a dance. Mm. He swings, I move, I swing. Bang. And then after, maybe there's a problem when I think about, oh my God, what the hell did I just do? What just happened? Right. Why, why do you think uh, relationships are so important? Because, uh, I mean, even in a lot of the work I do, that's, that's one of the main things people are looking for. It's like they, they want to find their partner mm. and I think so much is just it's a very primal natural human longing for union for the individual but also through the physical world that manifestation of duality like finding someone who completes us mm. uh, you know so it's interesting because your work you could really do it in any level it could be in business relationships right. or uh, employee employer relationships but there's something that's very powerful very primal and i think something that that almost everyone has some unresolved issues around which is uh, like a life's partner someone to 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 share that journey with mm. um and as you were saying there's so many stories around that whether it's from a man's point of view a woman's point of view there's all of these layers and some of those are socially given to us as societies we say this needs to, a man needs to be this way a woman needs to be this way within a family there's certain you need to find someone who's like this or who does this they have to be a doctor they da, da, da. And then a lot of internal, like this is what I need my partner to be in order to be happy. Like they have to, I mean, I, I was listening, it's, uh, there's these two guys I like on YouTube, they're called Abba and Preach, and, and they make some good videos, but there was a video of some woman and she was on a dating show and, and she gave a list of what her, what her future potential partner needed to be. 
and the list was literally like 150 things. <laughs> wow, really? And, yeah. and it's like you're never going to find that. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's someone who's not very open, you know. Yeah, you're allowed to make a list like of things qualities I like, you know. You definitely, but you want to be open to certain things, and there should be on that list some things that are um, deal breakers, you know, like things like they lie all the time right <laughs> that's a deal breaker or uh things like they're uh verbally uh abusive that would be a deal breaker right that's it they're a really great person but they have a bad temper and that's it that can be a deal breaker you know i remember eckhart tolle said uh, said it really well one time he said uh everyone has a pain body this is with his german accent everyone has a pain body uh but when looking for a partner, it would perhaps be wise to find someone whose pain body isn't very big. <laughs> yeah, that's the truth. That's the truth. I have always found that, that somebody with a big pain body, myself, you know, can get in and trigger each other to the point of no return. Yeah, uh, yeah that is nice. And then I have found um, over as, I, you know, and I think it was for me personally, it was, uh, that's what I loved. I remember my first girlfriend. She was so nice. But I, and that was like, I always wanted to have a scene in a movie, you know, let's make a drama, let's do it. Like I was looking for that fire all the time. So I always thought that that was way more exciting. But now I prefer the, the, the low pain body, you know, in myself and in there, you know, when it, but you know, I think it's also about uh, people being able to deal with each other's pain bodies, you know, being able to deal with having, you know, set them off. I'm trying to do or do you use trigger to kind of become a weird word, but mm -hmm. it is you trigger someone because of something happened. Like uh, I was recently taking a road trip and uh, was on the road with my bestie ex-girlfriend and uh, we're getting along great the whole day. It's like a magic dream day. And then someone starts honking behind me because there's this guy driving too slow in front of me. It's like midnight, I'm tired. Someone's honking. And coming up right on the car, I'm feeling the stress, I'm feeling the stress. So I say, I start flashing my lights. Hey, come on, man, get out, get into the right side. And then she's like, don't bother him, don't do that. And I'm like, and there's like car, two cars coming up around, I'm getting all boxed in. I'm like, and she's like, and I'm tired, man. I'm like, and she's like, uh, and I start honking. Oh, you can't honk at him. You're like, all of a sudden, I'm the bad guy, right? So then, you know, that set me off, you know? And then, but it was like a moment of, we were, like, that's what's so strange about life. We had only serenity all day and then one second. But it was like, there was obviously some pain body I have around this kind of tense situation. And there was some pain body she has around uh, probably me. <laughs> just uh, I don't know exactly. What, you know, she just uh, had to make me the bad guy in the situation. So yeah, the archetype of being the nice guy, not bothering people. Yeah, right. Yeah. So uh, anyway, we got past it, but everyone's okay. But that was uh, that was one of those uh, moments where the pain bodies were triggered, and there it is, a totally calm guy, the awakened lifestyle. There it is. Now we're having a fight in a car because uh, somebody was driving too slow in front of me. Like think of how dumb it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, what was your with the last one? I guess I mean you kind of answered it, but like, why focusing on relationships ah, is relationship. so important? Yeah, I know. Definitely, we all want to be uh, heard, listened to, seen, understood. Such a powerful, so important, and and with friends, you know, real connections with lovers, with with partners. We really all do crave that. And of course, we live in a time where uh, societal structures have uh, broken down. So it's not as like, hey, you have to have a wife and three kids by the, this age and do this and this and that. So all that's different. But any way you uh, slice it, any way you put it, we really want to partner up with somebody. We really want to connect in with somebody. Having another, a significant other that knows us, that sees us, that we see, that we can give to, that we can... Uh, give love to, that we can give appreciation to, that we can appreciation to, that we can uplift. This is a really um, important part for all people. And there's different ways to do that. So, you know, um, you know, with friends. So if you're some people, have, you know, really don't want to be in that kind of relationship, then they need to really deepen their friends, their friend circles, their community circles. It, we become so much more every time we connect with another person. And this is one of the... the <clears throat> my main things I tell people is, is every time you 
meet a new person, every time you take a risk to meet a new person, you bring the possibility of um, two human beings making connection. And there's nothing more you'll ever do in life that's more important than you connecting with another person. Because worlds are built, uh, families are built, uh, ideas come to into the world that can be expressed, communities are made. Uh, cities are are made. So it's just two human beings connecting and, and we are all the connector and it's really our duty to become the best connector we can be. Uh, and and that is, I think, from my perspective, our prime function. Connecting to myself, really connecting to myself, being being in tune with myself, being here in this moment. You know, by, And a lot of that has to do with observing, observing, you know, what's happening with me, not resisting what's happening with me, accepting what's happening within me, looking at the moment, noticing this plant, noticing the, the way everything is set up here um, in the room, noticing the room around me, noticing you, noticing your body language, noticing the way you listen, noticing that, and tuning in, and then I become way more present and not here. And then it's really just connecting, connecting in with the other person. And when you look at it in a noble way, especially in the dating realm, because people really, uh, for some reason, it's like, it doesn't look like a noble endeavor, but it really is. You're out there meeting people, you're connecting with people, you're uh, exploring yourself in the world with other people in this thing, and you're making connections. And when you can give it that n more noble thing, you'll treat people better when you meet them. And... Um, You'll treat yourself better too, and you'll be. And you know, a lot of people get nervous on dates. Or all our, we're, we're, when we look into another person's eyes, we're confronted with our insecurities, our inadequacies, inadequacies in the moment. And in some ways, like an actor on a stage in front of many people, and he loses or she loses her lines, forgets her lines. It's that moment of like, what now? Look, like end of the world, and learning how to deal with that moment and breathing through it and being still in it and finding peace in it. That that's like you know something that happens can it happens can happen every time you're out with a person and you're trying to connect with them because there's some reason you want to connect with them and you feel uncomfortable, but you find peace with it. For me, I'm generally relaxed, like my resting state is total chill because I've been through so many angst, angsty situations over and over and over again that it kind of burnt that part of me away, you know? mm. yeah. Although I won't say it's not there ever, I just have to always, I just eat, I've created a habit of overcoming it, you yeah. um, know. It's interesting, yeah. I also noticed a couple times in, in this podcast, uh, I think it's always been over Zoom when I'm doing those, but uh, you know, usually I have, a, a, based on what the other person is saying, I have a question that kind of arises so that when that next segue comes, I, I kind of know what I'm going to ask them. But there's a few times where that's like gone, like mm. I forget about it. Mm. And then there's this real like expanse because there's no, there's no question there. There's no thought. And, and it, it's, it's actually a bit scary at first. Like, I feel that adrenaline coming, the heart starts racing. Mm -hmm. And I think some is out of respect for them, for time, you know. Mm. I also never cut, so if there's some super long, awkward pause, like, that's just going to be there. <laughs> yeah. But it's this fascinating thing where actually everything becomes expanded. It's like all of those barriers then just drop away. And it's like there's no question. Mm. And it's this very interesting space where then it's like this tug of war between almost being content there, which is scary also in a way, and then also trying to somehow come back to the dynamic of the interaction we're having. Yeah. yeah. So... What are, when you're, when you're taking someone out on the street, what are, what are some of the, the common things that you see that hinder people really being able to open up and to share and to meet people and to connect? And, and then what are some of the, maybe the tools that you use to really try and help them like ease into that? 
you know, because even ease is a really interesting word, uh, you know, because a, a lot of even this podcast is around disease. And I think a lot of people don't even necessarily realize like the root of that word, like disease, disease, like the, the organism isn't in a state of ease. Mm. And then problems begin to arise, seemingly problems begin to arise. Mm. Although even those are usually just some natural response that arise from that, that state trying to bring the organism back into harmony. Mm. But from that place of ease, like how, what are... So I, I guess what are what are the common hindrances, and then what are what are like some tools, techniques, things you say that that help that person, like find that. Often we use the word flow now. That's become a really common yeah, term. Yeah, I actually made a course called Art of the Flow, tapping into the flow. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, the flow is cre you get into the flow by creating momentum, and you create momentum by simply going starting from the smallest place you can start to go from not doing to doing whatever that is and mm. whatever you're working on so if it was working out the smallest thing i might be able to do is one push-up that's not doing to doing and oftentimes that cascades into more push-ups you know and more things and jumping jacks and suddenly you're looking in the mirror and saying oh i can be ripped. I could really do this, you know. Suddenly you're doing uh, what's it called, Bobby's? Uh... Uh, I did Barry's boot camp. <laughs> wow, Barry's yeah, boot camp. I mean, Barry sore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was no, because I I have I have created a nice routine at home, but I was like I I always feel like uh, being a part a New Yorker. Everyone's always going to these classes and all those things, and it's very easy to get distracted at home. You know, it's like a challenge to not look at the phone and things. Mm -hmm. And to push yourself way beyond where you, you know. So uh, I kept telling my friends to go to these classes, invite me. And finally I said yes yesterday. So I'm paying for it. It's intense, you know, really intense. Uh, anyway, yeah, but you know what? I, I, I look at it like that. But also I, I, I start as it's a tale of two journeys. And everybody who comes to me is coming for, you know, they come to me with their own um beautiful ways of connecting with other people everybody has a, a persona everybody has something um that is beautiful and can connect with other people and uh, some people just haven't developed all these muscles there, there's muscles like a lot of people live a hundred percent in their head they walk down the street headphones in uh, either down here on the phone or just in their w little world and they don't notice what people walking by them uh they don't like they don't even see people looking at them they just totally zoned out of the present moment so they're they're not great observers and really being um a great artist or being great at you know really being present as being a great observer so really teaching people to tune in is level one right but the first thing i say to everyone this is a tale of two journeys your inner journey and the outer journey and the inner journey is really the journey. And the outer journey is I'm going to teach you some skills and we're going to develop some new, some new ways of communicating uh, that make you more engaging, more fun, uh, allow you to be more vulnerable. I'm going to teach you all those things. And a lot of them are really simple. Like I can just like, like for example, hello is really simple. Hello to a stranger. Uh, you know, all of a sudden, if I say hi to my my uh, someone I'm really comfortable with, I'm like, hey, what's up? How are you? How you been? What have you been doing? Uh, if I say hi to an attractive stranger, it, all of a sudden it could be like, hi. Ah, she doesn't look at me. <laughs> so there's that's because this is emotional blocks, right? So the emotional journey is when it's just like a Zen in the Art of Archery, a great book. He learns archery to learn Zen. And uh, over a 10-year period, it's a great book. But it's like you can take any aim and make it a Zen-like practice. You know, this practice of being in the now, this practice of being one with life, one with the moment, this practice. And uh, archery, obviously, is a skill, right? It's a skill you had to learn, but he was really learning something deeper through it. And it's the same thing, like a skill of meeting people in everyday places, uh, all around you that's a specific skill set you know or however you uh, uh, the skills of having to you know developing tools that help you be a better connector really a better listener uh, uh, developing a, the ability to share your interests and passions in a way that's engaging to other and interactive with other people uh, 
when you observe in someone that something's unique about them, like, wow, you're a really great listener. You really absorb on a deeper level what other people are saying to you. That's really unique. I appreciate that. You know, being able to say that to someone because it's true, because you've observed it and say it back to them is a specific skill to learn. And people really struggle with it, telling people, giving people a compliment. Uh, for example, the best compliment I ever got one time, I was hanging out with this guy, you might remember him, a uh, cool guy we both met at Dr. Job's place called Andoni, right? Hmm. And he's like a Greek god carved out of marble, really like the perfect human specimen, uh, kundalini master, uh, perfect diet, you know, just, just li seems to be living on the ether, you know, living outside normal life and some, like, he looked like a Greek god who comes down from the mountain to pick, you know, to take what he wants and go back to the mountain. You know? <laughs> so, but I, uh, we met him and he ended up just being a cool guy. And one day uh, we were both out in California. He, he would move there and I was out in LA and, uh, we connected and we went to some class. He took me to some class, some yoga class. And then we went and uh, we went to like uh, a bar, but we were just drinking water. And he just looked at me and he said, like this, took a moment, sat back, looked at me and said, you're a cool guy. <laughs> you're cool. And I was like, you know, it's like, hit me, you know? I thought he was cool for sure. But no guy ever turned to me and gave me a compliment like that my whole life, you know. In that way, maybe like after having done something like a sport or acting or something. But it was just no reason, nothing, just that's it. Now, inherently, I knew about myself. I'm a cool guy. I am. I mean, I can be. I have my moments, you know. Uh, but for that guy to reinforce that was a very powerful moment, you know. And where I'm from in the suburbs of Philadelphia, they definitely, it was like the best compliment you get, you know, it's like some backhanded compliment, you know, that shirt. You don't you look know. like a douche today. Yeah, you know what? That's, yeah, that's exactly the kind of, kind of, you don't look, hey, this looks good. You don't look like a douche today. Let's go. Yeah, and then that's the compliment, right? And that's, the, <laughs> that's very funny. Uh, so... Anyway, but really learning to have meet someone uh, just uh, for a moment in a coffee shop and be talking to them, getting to know them, and watching how really being tuned into them, like they're expressing uh, themselves with great enthusiasm, and moving their hands a lot, or whenever they talk about a certain su subject, their eyes light up, and you you say, oh, that's I really love when you talk about something you're passionate about. Your your whole body activates, and you're just saying what you see and saying it back to them. Uh, or various other things, and these when you go, when someone makes a list, they they can make a list of qualities they admire in others, qualities that they want in a partner, like someone who's a great listener, someone who's independent but also needs me, someone who's uh, uh, you know gets my sense of humor, uh, someone uh, who. Um, Etc. You know, whatever it is. So you can make that list, and then when you see it in those people you're connecting with, you can say it back, right? And if you see things like someone could be very physically appealing to you, but then you see things like qualities you really don't like, like internal qualities, like they're really selfish, or they seem thoughtless, or they just seem to be terrible at listening uh, to you, and not really, you know, only love talking about themselves. Um, those are qualities that would disconnect, you know. So it's like that's a better way to look at it than they have this, they have that, they, you know, all that kind of thing. So yeah, so it's really important, obviously, to be um, to be in relationships, but the relationship with yourself is the inner journey. And I give these six mantras, and I'll just rattle them off. We start like as if this is our um, this is our guide. You know, this is whenever we go out into um, the heat, when we go out and we push ourselves forward, we have a blueprint to operate from instead of everything feeling like um, chaos and, and something to remind ourselves that we are a good person and that what we are doing is good. So my instincts are good. My intuition is good is another way to say that whatever word resonates with you, but that I'm really, uh, and I've been denying my intuition, I've been denying my instincts. Uh, when I have them, I've been suppressing them. 
and maybe you know and you can look at the, where that is in your life and a lot of the times it's around connecting with other people I want to meet that person there's someone I want to meet no you don't want to do that you're not good enough the voices come in you're not good enough uh, you didn't you know you, uh, you didn't do your Barry's boot camp this week right you, do, you, you just haven't worked out in three weeks or you're not rich enough or um, you know, something's off with, some, I didn't sleep enough. It's I'm not enough. Okay, first way I won't. Now, so I'm denying my intuition, denying my instincts that are speaking to me from a much higher level than my mind. From a way, from, it's basically the reason we're all here is instinct. And it's evolved us for, I don't know, millions of years, right? And we're all here because of that, but we're denying it, blocking it. So then it's like, okay, then it's like, well, the situation's not perfect enough anyway. The person's there, and these people are there, and this is that. Or then it becomes to live with yourself. Ah, I wouldn't want to meet them anyway. This, you know, they look like uh, they look like they'd be, uh, you know, a mean person, or they look like you know, boring or whatever. Right? So that's what the mind does, and it eviscerates over and over. So really tuning in and giving honor, honoring your very powerful, powerful intuition honoring your very powerful powerful instincts and looking at them as your guide in life uh, and really learning to listen to them and if you have listened to them in other areas of your life uh, look how it's really served you even though it may not have seemed like it would in the moment and look at how it didn't serve you every time you denied your instincts usually it turns if you really deny them hardcore for long enough it turns into depression Right? You could just you leave your your mind keeps saying I have to be in this circumstance. I have to be in this relationship. I have to be in this box. And your interest is screaming no, no, no. And uh, you're not. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take medication because my intuition won't shut the fuck up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my instincts are saying you know, you know I'm going to take this medication. I'm not going to deal with the problem. Mm -hmm. So and that's a natural thing, right? So I really teach them to we take a long moment. And we go through this process of my instincts are good. And it becomes a mantra. My instincts are good. Then the next one is we build on that is my intentions are good. Like I said before, a lot of people feel like they're bothering someone like, hey, sorry to say hi to you. Uh, I'm not good enough. But I, I thought I would do it anyway because I wanted to throw myself in front of a bus and then feel really bad about this and never do it again. So it's like realigning yourself uh, and saying, yeah, my intentions are to give, are to give. My intentions are to receive and share in pleasurable experiences from simple hellos to both of us being outside of our head outside of our mind for a moment to a great amazing conversation to uh, the feeling of connection to great sex to a mind-blowing hug a, a kiss a relationship a family babies uh, um, that's my intentions my intentions are good not to take not to hurt but to give share and receive in pleasure that's such a huge one. Yeah. Because also there, there are so many of these conditions that are put on people and they think by doing something it means they're bad. Right. You know, because we're told if you do that, you, you're bad. And that's, that's such a huge thing. You know, like what are my intentions? If my intentions are good, then that's coming from a genuine place, an authentic place. You know, and... and very few things in life, although there are some, like, you know, obviously, like, rape is bad. We can, I think, categorically say that. But most things in life, like you said, like talking to someone, like, that can come from a bad intention place, and therefore it's probably bad. Mm -hmm. If it's coming from a place of good intention, that means it's good. You know, I think sometimes even things that are that simple, like, it's mm -hmm. hard for us because we just like to categorize things. Like, right. And then we cut ourselves off from life because that's like a block. That's a wall now. And it's, uh, you know, even in, in a lot of like, like plant work that I'm doing, like, what is the intention? You know, the intention is huge. Like any good doctor before they do, the, before they work, they set an intention. Like my intention is to help this person. My intention is to heal this person. Mm. And I think even just naming that, like, completely shifts the dynamic. 
Yeah, no, that's amazing. That's the and and it's like there is like like let's go like the bad doctor or the bad psychiatrist who uh, started to use it the the practice for his own devious uh, you know ideas or whatever. There's there's um, or even you could say uh, pharmaceutical companies are their intentions good or bad? I mean, to make profit is you know over actual healing is that a good intention or you know, is that a nefarious intention? So, um, yeah, so really setting that, remind yourself, that's my intention. That's where I'm coming from. I'm coming from this place. I'm operating from a good place. So my instincts are good. My intentions are good. However, and this is an important piece, detaching from any outcome whatsoever. So my instincts are good. My intentions are good. Sometimes they're misunderstood. Not everybody cares that you have good intentions. Not everybody's on your, your frequency. Not, uh, uh, not everyone sees it the same way. Not everyone's going to like you. So it's coming to this place that I'm trying to do things without an agenda. Like, for example, if I said to you, wow, you're really a handsome guy. And you're like, well, uh, no. And you keep walking. And I say, fuck you, man. You know? That's like, it's the same as if you've ever walked on the street and there's um, someone who's uh, asking for money and you and they're like, hey, you got a dollar? And you say, uh, sorry, man, I don't. I'll go fuck yourself. You know, it happens here because you know, people aren't, some mentally ill people in the streets. But the point is, it's that same idea. Or like they'll say something like, hey, I really love your hat. And I'll be like, oh, thanks, man. Can I have a dollar? No. Well, you got a fat ass. You know, whatever. <laughs> Keep walking, right? But guys do that in nightclubs, especially when they're drinking. That's like a classic thing. Like, hey, let's dance on you, book, bitch. You know, stuff like that kind of thing. So it's that's all primal ego, you know, unconscious and unconscious state, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, and also the internal uh, expectation. Because that's also something a lot we talk about in plant work is having an intention. Mm. Like, why am I doing this? Why am I, why am I about to potentially go into a lot of pain and suffering? Right. Well, hopefully it's for something good. That's the intention, right? It's yeah. for healing. Right, yeah. But then having to set aside the expectation. Because often with the intention, we think we know how it's going to work. Right. Like, if I have a good intention, then the person's going to be kind and gentle. But we never know, right? That's like, true. we can never control what's happening outside. So it may come in a way like we have no idea what's what's it could come in like 180 degrees of what our intention was. But if we don't have the expectation, then we can flow with that. We can we can be open to that. Yeah, and we can flow with it, you know. And of course, there's always a part like if someone gives you bad energy, it doesn't feel good because you're opening yourself to it, you know. You're like, okay, I'm here, I'm open, I'm listening, I'm opening. And if someone gives you like, ugh, you know, or whatever, but it's learning to a process, a practice, it's a practice, letting go of that energy and learning to say, you know what, I'm not for everyone. Mm -hmm. Or, you know what, maybe I was a little weird. Maybe I'm just, you know, I haven't been uh, very, you know, is, for example, I, I'm working with a client now who's a very high powered, uh, you know, tech god, tech guru. Super cool guy, great guy to have a conversation with, but he feels very uh, awkward. Arms are always crossed, uh, things like that. When he gets in social situations you, that aren't in his foray or aren't him being the leader of the company, he feels very awkward, and that's something he's dealing with. That's why I'm working with him. But um, so it's really coming to this place that I'm not for everyone, but really reminding yourself all the great things about yourself. Hey, I'm a good friend. I'm a good listener. I'm a, whatever you can remind. I, yeah, I am a cool guy. Uh, I'm fun. I have a good sense of humor. Just remind yourself. Like, have that self-talk. Remind. Don't don't try to say something you're not. Like, uh, hey, I'm a multi-billionaire. I mean, you can say that if you want to vision that. That's great. But just remind yourself the simple things of all the great things you are. And then be more of that. You know? Yeah, I am a nice guy. I am a kind person. Yeah, I am funny. Yeah, and you just give it. So my instincts are good. My intentions are good. Uh, I'm not for everyone, uh, and I'm okay with that. Actually, it's great. The more I accept that, the better it's going to be for me. I'm not for everyone. I'd love them to share in this fun moment with me but if, or, or to have a great date with me or to feel a great connection with me. But if not, 
that's okay. Uh, I'll go somewhere else and I'll keep moving on. And I'll go find someone who wants to connect with me, who wants to play with me, who wants to um, explore more with me. And that is the process and the practice. You know, it's a big practice of letting go. Right? And so what I do with those first three of six mantras is I build a practice around that called the social practice. Hey, today we're going to go out and go outside of our social comfort zone five times. And we can all define that differently. But it could be as simple as waving at five people, uh, giving a compliment to five people as you walk by. It can be a lot of things. It could be having a conversation with someone in a bookstore about books. It can be things that, uh, it can be going to an art gallery and talking to other people at the art gallery about the art you see. It can be this opening things up. Or even in my case, I said I'm going to go to Barry's boot camp because there's also a social component. There's also a other people component and connecting with people that I wouldn't normally connect with. That's like another social foray for me. So then the, the next three are a simple thing of uh, I've got a job to do. It's about taking ownership. Taking ownership of, of that I am the leader of my own life. That I am the one who must take all these risks. And, and that can manifest in different ways. But um, like that basically if I don't take these risks nothing changes. I don't have a new circumstance in life. These are uncomfortable risks. So I, I've got a job. It's my job to take every single risk, every single time. And in a tr traditional classic, and, and it really does play out this way often, is, is that if it was a man meeting a woman, it's often his job to initiate the conversation. It doesn't mean it, you know, it's locked in stone. It happens the other way. It doesn't mean the whole thing can't switch around in all different ways and manifest in all kinds of ways. But generally, if I'm working with a guy, I say it's my job to take every single risk from hello to will you marry me. You know, just kind of exaggerate that. But it's, it's his job to lead that and in, in that case her job to reciprocate but if I was coaching with a woman I would say the same thing it's your job to take every single risk and what risks aren't you taking that you need to take for example a woman could be walking down the street and, and see a guy who's handsome but not take the risk to really smile at him or look him in the eyes for an extended period of time or wave at him because of the same fear, the fear of rejection, the fear of I look like a fool, the, fi the fear I, I lose something by giving something over and over. So it's learning to let go of that and become the risk taker. And it's a huge deal. And then, of course, my instincts are good. My intentions are good. Sometimes they're misunderstood. I'm not for everyone. I've got a job to do. And it's not personal. Really connecting with other people, our need, like you said, our need to connect with other people is as personal as birds flying south for the winter or bees collecting pollen and going from one thing to another. It's as human as human can be. And we live in a, a society that's uh, the, doing what it's doing and we're here, a part of it, and um, we're operating within it. But it's as human as human can be. The desire and the need to connect and, and People that would make other people feel shame for that are really, really in the wrong. So, but it's the the truth is is there's some person that most people have in their head that's making them feel shame for that, and I'm not even out here in the real world, even though it may appear, you know, like that, uh, you know, there's like some gifts of like someone screaming like they hate men or they hate women or there's some gifts some, or people are watching and judging. There's some old granny watching and judging from just and they have them in their own head more than they're in real life. And it's learning that, that, that this isn't personal. This is human. And you are doing, you are playing your part in this. The difference between us perhaps and the, and the, the flock of seagulls is that uh, we're just not as tuned in with our instincts. So then the final thing of that is, is that it's the most important job in the world. It's the job of the connector. And it's your job to go out and connect with other people and understand that there's nothing more beautiful, nothing more profound, nothing more important in your life than connecting with other people. And you can see that. People have built empires, but yet they're disconnected from friends and family and lovers. They have found ways to fulfill base needs because of their empires. But to ha uh, and then there's people who build empires and have it all. 
and that's the more beautiful life. They're really connected, you know. Uh, you think of certain, you can think of many people that have, have seem to have that going. Um, yeah, so it's really about that. But again, it's not like I, I never define what one person, what lifestyle somebody wants to live. Like, for example, many people have worked with me and met their spouses while they were with me, in front of me, or during our time to process of working together or shortly thereafter, because that's the vision they had for their life. They wanted to be married. They wanted to have kids. They wanted to do that. But not everybody has that vision for their life. People want to be connected in other ways, but we must be connected and deeply. Yeah. Mm. Do you see the the work you're doing kind of staying the same, or have you noticed there, there there's been a change of flow over the years? Like, is it moving towards something, or, or you're it just kind of always unfolding, and you you also don't really know where it's going? Well, yeah, no, I mean, I have a vision for it, and I've been really tuning back into it lately. But yeah, that you know, when you start something. It was fun for me to do the way I was doing it. It was where I was personally at. And then after a while, it's like you created a, you know, like a musician who created an album that you have to go out and sing because people want to hear that song. You know? And that's the song you promote, and that's the song that took off. And that seemed beyond my control. You know? um, I did what I could. The universe said, yeah, you can do this. You can do this one. And I was like, all right, I'll do this one. I'm, uh, it's, uh, it's just, I'm enjoying it most of the time. And, um, but yeah... For me, it really is now just about taking those principles and more and really sharing with all people in all ways, you know, not just always about dating, but that's the niche, you know, dating, relationships, connections, friendships, but really taking that very powerful teaching that I've discovered and just sharing it with as many people as possible in every situation, you know, and, and whatever they're, you know, wherever they're at in their life, because everything I said is a universal and it's a way of seeing it. It's another way of practicing it, another way of being. And I would say, uh, like, if we were to look at the, the world we're living in with, this, with uh, you know, I would think personally Instagram, the world was better before Instagram. Everyone was less of a cliche or, or Twitter where everything wasn't binary, you know. Um, there's obviously some benefits of those things for maybe creating a brand for yourself and things like that. But there's the... Um, this thing where everyone's becoming an algorithm almost like you're just an algorithm you're just that thing and that's what that, what's happened so we're almost becoming like artificial we're like becoming what artificial intelligence wants us to be we're becoming robots so to speak so it's like how can i break out of that every day and be a human fucking being how can i be a human being uh, really, and really not just swiping and connecting and ordering people to my house and ordering food. How can I go out and participate in the world and break free my true persona now in this world now? How can I be one more person that does that and stops the madness? And that's really what I would be teaching, how to break free, how to create this social habit of really connecting with other people that aren't like you. And the pandemic, one of the things it did was put really put people in their tribes. Their little internet bubbles are all tuning into this. And then you get in your the little whatever, you know. And, and people are only like one-dimensional. There's no human beings in these things. They're all one-dimensional. They're all pumping something, promoting something, trying to get more followers, more likes, more this, more that. And if there is somebody that's not doing it, you don't know because <laughs> they're not doing it and they're not finding, their, they're not finding their, the people that will you know, go into their thing. But what happened is there was a major breakdown of society. For example, like in New York, people love sneakers. Alt people, they love sneakers. They love cool sneakers. So I meet people literally just because I'm wearing cool sneakers that I would never have met. Oh, hey, I love your kicks. Yeah, thanks, man. And you start talking about this thing that seems minor, but it's a way that our society is fabric. Or if I go to a coffee shop and there's uh, someone that's a college student and I'm not in college and they have a different point of view about a lot of things than me, but if they were only in their little bubble and I was only in my little bubble, uh, we became enemies. But then I start talking to them again, and they start seeing me, and I'm, we're just people, and we're hanging, and we're connecting. All of a sudden, all kinds of people that aren't like you, and that's the, was the beauty of the way our society flows, is that you deal with everybody. 
and you connect with everybody and you try to find the humanity in everybody and I really think most people are that way despite what other people might say and what's happened since we've been back open is, is that's happening again and all of a sudden there seems to be less social chaos and less tribal stuff and all that so it's like but making it not just making it not just a let a hap, letting it happen it's like actively going out and, and making it happen you know for yourself and for everyone else i mean that's huge because that that's really there's all this speak about community and things but really community is like a diverse group of people like even traditionally it's like you had the cobbler you had the baker you mm -hmm. had the the tailor, you had the farmer, like all of those people are bringing something different, you know, and it, mm. it's something that, that really seems like, you know, you were even saying like one of the, the guiding principles you teach people is like this idea that like, like putting aside other people's views of me because I am different. You know, mm. and we preach these things like diversity and yet so much of the public discourse is conformity. You have to think this way. You have to do these same things. And, and if right. you don't, then you're evil somehow, which is completely against this idea of diversity, like diversity of thought, diversity of lifestyle, diversity of choices. That's and, why we moved to New York. Yeah. And it did change. You know? Yeah. And, you know, like recognizing that fundamental, like uniqueness of all people. And by bringing all of that together, we actually do create a community. Like when you have all of these, like, different people, different jobs, different professions, different lifestyles, different ways of viewing. And as you were saying, that's such a poor, an important thing. Because when we are in a community or society that only thinks one way, that, that says the same things, that watches the same channels, it's actually that's leading towards death. Like there's no creativity, there's no renewal, there's no change, like these fundamental principles of life, mm -hmm. you know. That's entropy, and life is the opposite of entropy. It's change. It's mm. a fundamental quality of life. So I think that's so important. You know what what you're trying to do, even this with this idea of interpersonal community. Mm. You know, and then on a bigger scale too. Like that really is. It's it's life giving in a way. Mm. And uh, do you have a sense of? Uh, because so much of your work is interpersonal, like working with people. And, and it also seems like so much of the way we're moving as a society is digital, is online, which in a way, there is a direct experience, but we're also removed in a way from like the physical senses, which, which are so powerful. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's very different, even with this podcast. Like it's, it's different if I'm interviewing someone online versus in person, like there's, right. there's yeah. just something that's different. There's an intangible, there's without getting too hippie, you know, like there's, there's an auric feel there, there's mm. energy, you know, like there's a presence when you're next to someone, you can feel things. Right. There's, 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 there's something that's different. Yeah. That's really true. But do you think that's, uh, do you think, you or even we can find ways to still do that without going too much into this, you know, as you said, like the food is just delivered to us. Yeah. It's very different rather than going into a restaurant, like especially in New York, right? Sitting next to these people, you know, you're like this, which a lot of people from outside of New York don't like. Right. But I think people in New York, you, there's actually something like you begin to like that. It's like there's that physical proximity. There, there, there's something that's happening. There's an energy that's created around being around other people. It's amazing. And to find, to build a lifestyle, for example, uh, I don't shop at Costco. Uh, I, I mean, you can go get, if you get the deals, get the deals. You know, I'm going to tell you not to get a deal. But you're probably not going to meet uh, anybody you want to meet there. I mean, it might be, you know, but... Uh, be open, but I'm saying generally I don't shop for the month. I don't shop for three months I go and I shop out. I live in a city and I can do this So everyone's in a different circumstance, but I do uh, You know I get some fundamentals I need to have every day, but generally I go to the supermarket every day I go to uh, the, You know I'm sure it's cheaper for me to just buy the, my favorite tea and have it at home and I do 
but I still go out and I get it at the place and I'm around people and I'm picking up the energy and I'm open to meeting new people. I'm open to uh, connecting with people. Uh, for me, I love absorbing that energy. So I'm putting myself in places, even that new Barry's boot camp thing, or uh, if I go to a, a meditation class, like I meditate at home, it feels great. I cut out the commute. I don't have to walk somewhere. I don't have to walk home. I don't. I found my practice. Uh, but going to the class with other people of the same kind of minds so who are experiencing the same kind of thing, that's very powerful. So I'm adding that into my routine. All these things. How can I be more connected to other people? And and to be honest, I went to something the other day, and there was people I would not be connecting with otherwise and all of a sudden we were talking not about this current event stuff we we're connecting on another level we experienced something together you know so and that's very powerful and the reason we're friends is because we experienced something together you know we connected uh, and now here we are uh, some years later right here we, here we are uh, because we went through like a boot camp. We went through intense moments. We went through real living together. And that's how you make new bonds and new friends. So so it's really important to do those little things like I love jasmine tea, find in my place to get the jasmine tea, connect with the people that own it or work there and whoever's serving you, uh, you know, on a human level, not on a purchase, not on a consumer level, you know, if you can. And there's ways to do that. And then uh, perhaps connect to the people with no agenda in the cafe. You know, whoever's around you, start up a conversation. Connect with them. Uh, and try to steer away from the hot button topics, you know, like politics or what, you know, we get still dealing with this whatever virus pandemic. It's try to, it's try to uh, stay away from that. It's so easy to talk about. Try not to be boring, you know. Try to bring connect on a higher level, you know. And if you find yourself going down those things, try to move the energy somewhere else within yourself or with the other person, right, to somewhere higher. Try to really connect with the people around you. Go to a bookstore. So I would say, like, make a small list or a big list of your interests and passions. Things I, you know, and this is an important way to be an attractive person. Being attractive is being interesting and interested. In order to be interesting, you have to be interested in your own life. So if you're feeling often like stuck or stagnant or depressed, moving backwards, it's because you're not leaning into your interests, leaning into things you want to try, leaning into those things. So a small thing that I'm uh, that I feel slightly passionate about is jasmine tea. You know, I like the jasmine tea. It uplifts me. It's refreshing. Uh, it makes my brain just kind of light up in the morning, and I feel the perfect amount of lift without a crash. So now I have an interest. Uh, I can go to places that have it. I can meet people. I've actually dated a girl who became my girlfriend for a couple years who owned a tea shop, you know, following my bliss for tea. And also I flirted with all the girls that worked at the shop before I met her. So it was like, it was, but it was flirting. It was socializing, not just the girls, the guys. We were hanging. With, I mean, they became my friends because I was there every day and we were having, like, unlike most people, uh, I wasn't just having an exchange. I was having, a, I was uh, getting to know them, connecting with them. They, they, you know, not because I was anybody other than a guy who came in with the right en with with energy of I want nothing, I need nothing. I'm just here to connect, and it was a special place. So, but I dated the owner, and now I can't go back. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> so, uh, so. Um, but so just even tea and being able to talk about that, why I like it. What about you? What kind of, uh, you know, what's your, what uplifts you in the morning? You know, that could just create a conversation. Um, or a bigger interest or passion, like, um, like I'm really into uh, playing the guitar. I'm really into learning a specific song from the Rolling Stones. I'm learning this one song. I'm having that. It's a real challenging time getting it, but, uh, you know, I love to do it because it really helps me focus and then I, you know, get to make a song. Or I'm really into, you know, uh, traveling. You know, I've been here. I'm going. I want to go here. So being able to share those things or, and if you're feeling disconnected, it's like, what can I do to get into my interests and passions? That makes you more interesting rather than, I read tweets all day. Right, which we're all guilty of, I'm sure. I watch news all day and I recite it like uh, I regurgitate it with some acerbic opinion. Right, that's probably different than yours. Uh, 
And uh, uh, that's not interesting. That's low frequency. All that shit's low frequency. I'm taking in other people's thoughts, low frequency thoughts all day, and I'm regurgitating it back to you. So that's your lowest self. So tuning into interest and passions, whether it's like now, uh, doing, hey, you know what, I'm going to join, uh, do a 30-day yoga challenge. I'm going to go, and going outside to do it, going into places to do it. And that's how you meet new people and make new friends. It can happen in a split second. It doesn't have to be hard. And you're going outside and you're allowed, if you're shy, you're allowed to be shy. It's okay. Uh, it, if you're feeling introverted, it's okay. Go anyway, you know. Uh, and just go beyond yourself every day. And then, of course, I find it fun to have a total random quality to things. I'm just going to go walk down the street and and the world brings me things. And where, and where we live here or where I'm living is in New York. And that's why I love it. You know, because life just comes to you all day. And if you're there for it, uh, you can really turn what seems to be nothing into something amazing. For example... Uh, my my ex girlfriend Bestie, we met ten years ago on a park bench that I just happened to be in a, that neighborhood that I'm never in and she's never in and we just she happened to be on that bench on that day and my first thought was uh, my back hurts I'm tired uh, my first thought was wow that's the most beautiful girl I ever saw my second thought was is my back hurts I'm tired. Uh, maybe I'll try something like that tomorrow. <laughs> and then my next thought was, is if I just say hi, I win. Because I went past that point of resistance. And I did say hi. And, you know, 10 years later, we're besties. Bestie besties. You know what I mean? So it's like, and we've been through it all together. So that's like cool. You know, and that happened from something to nothing. And I can name countless uh, experiences I've had, countless, all over the world where something amazing happened by me taking that that risk and then taking the next risk and the next one and then something happens and what's the risk it's the emotional risk that uh, i'll get rejected uh, or that i'll uh, that i'll cross I'll, I'll do something wrong or I'll cross the line but when when i know that i'm actually not doing anything wrong or i'm not crossing a line or you know or if someone if you do cross a line and for the other person, everyone has their own boundaries, then you listen, then you respond accordingly. But mostly the line is all in your mind, you know? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not. And sometimes, and, that, and you have to listen. That's what listening's for. So, yeah. yeah. Well, great, brother. I think we're coming up on our uh, time limit. We've gone, uh, yeah, getting close to two hours. So. Oh, is that right? Wow. wow. That's cool. Yeah. Nice. Well, cool, easy. man. I yeah. appreciate it. Let's we, do it again. Yeah, right. let's. I think we we got easy another two hours. We could talk. Yeah, about, easy. So yeah, we'll, we'll make a part. We do two. a weekly. We can do a radio <laughs> show here, right? Yeah. Well, it's great, right. man. I mean, all of these are are, are uh, I think really important topics for the time we're living in. But even you know a lot of this audience, it's it's about plant work, about growth, spirituality, mm. and and everything you're talking about. I mean, directly relates into this work, mm. just in a very different way. Right. And yet, I think it's been said so many times, like you know, truth is one, and you even use that word a few times, like truth. And for mm. me, that's that's a vital word. Right. And yeah. something that's actually I think really lacking in the time we live is truth. Right. And Big you time. know, truth is one, paths are many. And, you know, the more we can bring all of these paths together, I think we get closer and closer to that truth. So, yeah, that's great. Thank you, brother. Excellent, man. Thanks yeah. for having me on. Yeah. 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 It's great to see you, man. It's yeah, been, great to see it's you, It's been too. a long time. I know. It's been amazing. It's, 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 uh, well, we hope you move back here, yeah? Yeah. For at least a little while. Right? Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. All right, everybody. That is it. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with John. I really enjoyed sitting down with him, catching up with him. He's a very dear friend of mine, uh, so that was a really beautiful opportunity for me, and I think he had some really uh, important things to share. So that's it for this episode. Uh, as always, if you're able to support the podcast, that's a really big help to me. Patreon is a really good option. It's a subscription service. You can sign up, um, and that really helps me to continue to bring on these guests. Um, so to all the people who have done that, thank you very much. I, I deeply appreciate that. If you're able to do that, thank you very much. Now with YouTube, there's also the option to do that directly via YouTube uh, with a join button. You can check that out. There should be a little join button below the video. There's also the option to direct donate via PayPal. I'll put a link to all of those in the show notes. And then if you're not able to do that, um, subscribing to the show on the YouTube version, turning on the notification bell, liking the video, that's a really big help. And then with the audio version going on Apple Podcasts, following the show and leaving a starred rating and a short review. 
So thank you all for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, my next conversation is going to be with my friend Alex Ek um, Eklin. He's uh, a, a jiu-jitsu practitioner. I practice, we had the original, we originally had the same coach, who was a guy named uh, Vitor Shaolin Hiberto. And uh, Alex was also one of the teachers there. I have a lot of respect for him. And we got into some of the, the ideas and principles behind martial arts. Uh, also spoke a lot about Taoism and how that's really influenced it and a little bit about the, the meeting point between martial arts and plant work. So that'll be next week's episode. So thank you all for tuning in and I will see you all next week. Thank mm -hmm. you.